Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, sorry for the delay, everyone. Our uh, next uh, next talk is uh, by Joshua Lut Lutzak, uh, who comes to us from Leibniz University of Hanover, and he'll be speaking to us about the aims of statistical mechanics. Nice. Um, so thank you for the introduction, and um, thank you to Wayne and the other organizers for putting on and arranging what um, is shaping up to be a, a great conference. I'm quite chuffed to have um, been included alongside a number of great speakers and at a conference that's got such a, um, an amazing history. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I remember coming to these as a, a graduate student. Uh, and I've got fond memories of that. It's really nice to be back at Western and to be part of it now. All right, so let's talk about um, the aims of statistical mechanics. So many authors claim that an aim of statistical mechanics is to provide a suitable foundation for um, thermodynamics. Here, for example, is Craig Callender, who in 2001 wrote, um, kinetic theory and statistical mechanics are in part attempts to explain the success of thermodynamics in terms of the basic mechanics. Here's another example. This one comes from Katrinka Ritterboss, who in 2002 writes, one of the cardinal aims of the theory of statistical mechanics is to underpin thermodynamic regularities by a theory formulated in terms of the dynamical laws governing the motion of the macroscopic constituents of a thermodynamic system. Now, some authors even go as far as to claim that it is um, the aim of statistical mechanics to provide a suitable foundation for thermodynamics. Here, for example, is um, Frigg, uh, Roman Frigg, who in 2011 makes a stronger claim. He says, by and large, there is agreement that the aim of statistical mechanics is to derive fully and rigorously the laws of thermodynamics from the underlying micro theory. Now, um, now, while I don't think that Frigg is right that there is by and large agreement that this is the aim of statistical mechanics, or in fact that any of the people speaking at this conference um, or who use statistical mechanics would say that this is the aim of um, statistical mechanics, or that even it is in fact the aim of statistical mechanics, I do think that there is a whole bunch of philosophical literature that has been devoted to um, this project. Now, now what I think is interesting to note about this um, literature is that despite its size, um, so much of it is focused on providing an account of irreversible processes. Um, I take it this is because many of the authors contributing to this discussion think that this is one of the most important, if not the most important part um, of the foundational project. Here again is Katrinka Ritterboss. Um, it's from that same paper. And here she writes, the dynamical origin of thermodynamic irreversibility represents perhaps the most important unsolved problem in the conceptual foundations of statistical mechanics. <coughs> now for a long time um, the second law of thermodynamics was thought to be the only um, thermodynamic law that dealt with irreversible processes and so naturally um, a lot of authors both past and even today um, see the task of underpinning irreversible processes as being synonymous with providing a foundation for the second law of thermodynamics. Um, here again is Roman Frigg, who um, roughly says, um, well, gives away that kind of this kind of um, this kind of image. 
He writes, a gas that is confined to the left half of a container uniformly spreads over the entire available space as soon as the confining wall is removed. Yet we never observe the reverse process of a uniformly distributed gas suddenly concentrating in the left half of the container. Such irreversible behavior is characteristic of many processes and is enshrined in the so-called second law of thermodynamics, which roughly states that entropy cannot decrease in isolated systems. Statistical mechanics aims to explain irreversible behavior in terms of the dynamical laws governing the individual molecules of which the gas is made up. Now, in 2001, Harvey Brown and Jo Skufink um, revealed that the spontaneous approach to equilibrium from an arbitrary initial state, um, an irreversible process previously thought to be part and parcel of the second law, um, is actually captured by an independent and more basic law of thermodynamics, the minus first law. The separation of these two laws, I think, um, encourages us to ask the following two questions. First, um, how should we interpret these authors who contribute to this vast literature? How, I mean, how should, how should we understand what it is that they're attempting to be doing when they claim to be aiming to account for irreversible processes? Are they attempting to provide an, inter, uh, an underpinning for the second law of thermodynamics, the minus first law, both laws, something else entirely? Um, and second, separate from this interpretation question, right, what is it that they're actually doing? Um, I think there's this other question. Well, what should contributors to this foundational discussion be aiming for? Here are the aims of the talk. So um, first, I'm going to highlight that um, the aim of underpinning irreversible processes is, strictly speaking, ambiguous. It depends on what we mean by irreversible. Second, um, despite this ambiguity, I want to suggest that, um, by and large, contributors to this foundational discussion of irreversible processes um, are actually engaged with providing a suitable foundation for the minus first law despite the way in which they often state their aims. And third, um, I want to suggest that contributors to, the foundational pro uh, to this foundational project of accounting for irreversible processes neither aim directly at accounting for the minus first law or the second law, but rather that they aim at accounting for the phenomena that support the laws of thermodynamics. Um, oh yeah, so here's thing, one thing I want you to note. So um, anybody who may have carefully read the abstract that I created for this talk, or um, <laughs> by chance has happened to come across the article that I recently had published in analysis on these matters, um, how many aims are we aiming at? Um, in both of those places, I suggested that contributors to the um, foundational discussion of irreversible processes um, aim at accounting for both the minus first law and the second law of thermodynamics. Um, but I now realize that I think this probably isn't the best way to articulate what I actually think about these matters. Um, and so it's worth noting that um, this third point um, is expressed differently from what I've written elsewhere. And I think importantly, this better captures what I actually think, right? That, um, as we'll see, I think they should aim at accounting for the phenomena that support the laws of thermodynamics rather than account for the laws. OK. Here's the outline of um, my talk today. So in a moment, I'm going to talk about um, 
some notions of reversibility and some background concepts. And then in the second section, um, I'm going to talk about the content of two laws of thermodynamics, the minus first law and the second law. And both of these sections license the conclusion that the aim of underpinning irreversible processes is, strictly speaking, ambiguous. And then in the third section, I'll answer those two questions I raised a moment ago. Right? Namely, how should we interpret those who state that their aim is to account for irreversible processes? Mm -hmm. And second, what should those contributing to this foundational debate be aiming at? Okay. So first, um, some notions of reversibility and some background concepts. Okay, the state of a system is typically represented by a point in some state space. For example, the thermodynamic state of a system is represented in a, um, by a point in a state space characterized by a small number of macroscopically measurable um, parameters, so often things like temperature, volume, entropy, and pressure. And a state history or process is a sequence of states through state space. Now, a theory's laws right, um, delimit a definite class of state histories. And we say that a law is time reversal invariant if and only if, whenever a state history is permitted um, by theory's laws or by our law, then the time reverse state history is as well. That is the state history that we arrive at by reversing um, the sequence of the original history and each um, member of the sequence according to some state reversal operation. For classical thermo uh, thermodynamics, the state reversal operation is simply the identity operation. Okay. Now on to um, the many meanings of reversible. Um, I'm going to talk about two of them, but it's worth noting that there are others. Okay. Um, sometimes the term reversible is used to mean time reversal invariant process. That is to state histories whose time reverse state histories are also permitted by the theory's laws. In these contexts, irreversible, naturally enough, is um, used to refer to time reversal non-invariant processes. That is to processes whose state histories are permitted by um, the laws, but whose time reversed sequence is not according to the theory possible. Okay, now sometimes um, the word reversible is used to mean what might better be thought of as recoverable. Um, and actually enough, irreversible in these contexts might be better thought of in terms of irrecoverability. So what do I mean by these things? Well, um, look, experience suggests that in many cases the transition from an initial thermodynamic state to a final state um, cannot be fully undone once the process has taken place. And by fully undoing the process, I mean not just a return of the system to its initial state, but also its environment. The free expansion of an adiabatically isolated um, ideal gas that does no work on its environment is an obvious example of a um, irreversible process in this sense. Right? In situations such as these, there's no pr uh, there's no process, sorry, no available process um, in which it's possible to recover the initial state <coughs> completely. Now, um, as Jos Ufink has pointed out in a paper entitled Bluff Your Way in the Second Law of Thermodynamics, 
Um, this notion of um, reversibility differs from the previous notion in the following three ways. First, um, there's reference to and an emphasis placed on the system's environment. Right? For a process to be recoverable, it needs to be the case that the um, initial system environment state be recovered. Second, um, the only thing that matters for reversibility understood as recovery is a return of the initial state. We don't need to specify a history reversal operation um, that ensures that the system and its environment pass through the reversed sequence of states, right? We don't need um, to specify a um, reversal, history reversal operation that, say, takes us from this, right, back through this. But it's got to be possible to go from this, right, back to the initial state in some way. Now, a third difference between these notions of reversibility um, concerns the concept of possibility that is implicitly invoked in talk of undoing the process. Um, the concept of uh, recoverability differs from reversibility understood as time reversal um, invariance in that recoverability is concerned with um, state, uh, sorry, with histories that can be actualized, not merely ones that are compatible with a the theory's laws. Right? So for a process to be reversible in this sense, it needs to be the case that for beings like us, right, with our um, physical and epistemic limitations, <clears throat> we can recover the initial state. Okay. So given these differences, it's the case that um, recoverability does not imply and is not implied by time reversal invariance. And irrecoverability does not imply and is not implied by time reversal non-invariance. OK, so now let's remind ourselves with the foundational project that I said kind of everyone's talking about and that kicked off my discussion here today. Right. underpinning irreversible processes. It should already be clear, given what I've said about time reversal invariance and about notions of reversibility, that this task of underpinning irreversible processes is, strictly speaking, amb ambiguous. Right? It can be interpreted in at least one of two ways. Um, the task could be understood as one that involves using statistical mechanics to account for processes that are described by laws that are time reversal non-invariant. Um, or it could be understood to involve accounting for processes that render their initial states irrecoverable. OK, I now want to talk about um, two laws of thermodynamics, the minus first law and the second law. I'm going to begin by talking about the minus first law. OK, so as I said, um, in 2001, um, Harvey Brown and Jo Su Fink um, wrote this paper and they coined the expression the minus first law. Now, it's worth noting that um, earlier authors both appreciated um, the content and um, and considered, like Yos and Harvey, um, this law to be more basic than other laws of thermodynamics. But it's worth noting that commonly um, the content of this law is invoked without recognising or flagging that it is, um, is a law. OK, well, what does it say? So the minus first law says that an isolated system in an arbitrary initial state within a finite fixed volume will spontaneously attain a unique state of equilibrium. 
like the other laws of thermodynamics, um, this law intends to capture a phenomenological fact. Um, and you can think of this law as um, consisting of three independent um, claims. What might be thought of as an existence claim, a uniqueness claim, and a claim about the spontaneity of the approach to equilibrium. The minus first law says that, an, um, that for an isolated system in an arbitrary initial state within a finite fixed volume, right, there exists an equilibrium state that the system will approach. It says that this equilibrium state is unique and that beginning from some arbitrary state it will be approached spontaneously. Now what's important um, for our purposes is the characterization of equilibrium that underlies the existence claim that's part of the minus first law. And as Brown and Ufink explain, um, what characterizes the equilibrium state is that, well, once they're attained, they thereafter remain constant in time. So spelled out like this, it's clear to see that the minus first law is time reversal not invariant. The law is time reversal not invariant because of how we're supposed to understand um, equilibrium states. Right? Once, the, um, once a system's equilibrium state has been reached, no spontaneous departure from it is possible without some kind of intervention from the environment. Um, okay, so the minus first law says that um, a system will either be in a unique state of equilibrium or else spontaneously be approaching um, equilibrium. So now if we take the goal of underpinning irreversible processes to be synonymous with the goal of accounting for the spontaneous um, approach to equilibrium from an arbitrary non-equilibrium state, right, then the goal is aimed at um, then, then the goal of underpinning irreversible processes right, is aimed at um, accounting for those processes that are characterized by the time reversal non-invariant minus first law. Okay, now let's talk about um, the second law of thermodynamics. So classical thermodynamics standardly um, identify some version of these three statements um, of the second law. All right, we've already seen one of these before in Wayne's talk, but there are these two others. The first one is the um, Kelvin statement, which says, no process is possible whose sole result is the complete conversion of heat into work. Then there's the Clausius statement, which says, heat can never pass from a colder body to a warmer body without some other change connected therewith occurring at the same time. And the entropy statement, which says, the thermodynamic entropy of an adiabatically isolated system cannot decrease. Right? As I'm sure most of you already know, um, these three statements modulo a few basic qualifications are equivalent to one another. So this presumably is the reason why contributors to this foundational project um, state that their aim is to, count, uh, to account for the second law of thermodynamics rather than a particular statement of the law. Now what I want to flag at this point, um, stressing something that um, Wayne mentioned in his talk is that, um, well, the second law only applies to systems at equilibrium. In fact, thermodynamics is, with the exception of the minus first law, a theory about equilibrium states. But I guess, you know, that, that thermodynamics is a um, theory about equilibrium states is probably already familiar to you especially if you've spent time looking at PV diagrams um, as I have, you know, that I've got displayed here or else by looking at things like temperature entropy diagrams. 
Um, these spaces solely consist of equilibrium states. And so, as such, processes described by the minus first law um, cannot properly be represented in them. That's why they appear typically um, as these dashed lines. So here we've got um, two different expansions of an ideal gas. The solid line here um, represents the um, reversible, that is recoverable, quasi-static isothermal expansion of a gas by um, a path of equilibrium states. And this dashed line represents the adiabatic um, free expansion of an isolated ideal gas that does no work on its environment. Now both of these systems begin and end with the same um, pressure, temperature and volume, but they take different paths to get there. Right? And only one of these paths is represented completely. Properly speaking, the free expansion is only represented by points at one and two. Okay. Now, the minus first law predicts that the freely expanding gas will spontaneously approach a unique state of um, equilibrium. The second law makes no such predictions. Right? It's only concerned with um, equal transitions between systems initially and finally at equilibrium. Right? It says nothing about transitions from non-equilibrium states. The second law says that um, some of these transitions are reversible, that is recoverable, that is, I mean, the system, um, the system environment initial state can be fully recovered from its final state. In the context of this example, the second law um, says that the quasi-static isothermal um, expansion of the gas can be, um, that initial state can be recovered and the free expansion, um, sorry, the, um, the system who's um, resulted in um, this final state via the free expansion cannot be um, one in which we can then recover the initial state from. Okay, so now let's return to these questions. Right. Um, again, how should we interpret those contributors to this foundational debate who claim that their aim is to account for irreversible processes? Right? Are they after the minus first law, the second law, both laws, something else? And second, what should they be aiming for? Now, as the previous section hopes to have made um, evident, um, if the goal of underpinning irreversible processes is understood to be synonymous with using statistical mechanics to provide a foundation for the second law, then the aim is to justify why certain transitions from between equilibrium states render initial states irrecoverable. On the other hand, if the goal of underpinning irreversible processes is supposed to be synonymous with the aim of accounting for the spontaneous approach to equilibrium from some arbitrary initial state, right, then the aim is to underpin the minus first law. But since these laws are distinct and logically independent with one another, claims that underpinning, um, claims that underpinning irreversible processes understood as, um, understood as accounting for the minus first law cannot be understood to be synonymous with claims that um, the aim is to underpin the second law. Okay, so what the hell do these, what the hell do these people even mean then when they claim that um, they're aiming to account for irreversible processes? Right. What I mean, what is what is free really aiming for here? 
say. Well, something to note is, I mean, unlike many successful physical theories, statistical mechanics does not have a generally, um, does not possess a generally accepted formalism. What we've got is um, a collection of different approaches and schools, each with their own agenda, toolbox of techniques, and mathematical apparatus. Um, when one looks closely at foundational debates concerning irreversible processes, however, um, the most prominent approaches that are drawn from include various strands of neo-Boltzmannianism, Gibbsians um, who rely on mixing, and interventionism. Now, while these approaches are quite different, they're at least united in the sense that when one looks beyond the stated aims of um, people working within these frameworks, they're all primarily concerned with accounting for the fact that systems prepared in some arbitrary um, initial state spontaneously approach a state of equilibrium. Right? That is, these um, approaches are united in their pursuit of underpinning the irreversible processes that are captured by the time reversal non-invariant minus first law. So on the basis of this, right. it appears that despite the ways in which those contributing to this discussion often state their aim, like Frigg does here where he points to the second law of thermodynamics, I think it's best to interpret these people as um, aiming to account for proce those processes that are better described by the minus first law. 10 minutes? Thank you. Okay, so that's the first question answered, but the second question remains. So what should those attempting to um, underpin irreversible processes be aiming for, right? As I indicated a few moments ago, I mean, one way of interpreting this aim is um, to view it as the goal of justifying why certain transitions between equilibrium states render initial states irrecoverable. That is, to see it as synonymous with underpinning the second law. So should contributors to, the, to this discussion be um, accounting for the second law? Or should they merely aim, as they have been doing, despite not realising it, at simply trying to um, underpin the minus first law? Or should, they, or should they aim for both, or something else entirely? Well, I mean, remember, since they claim, since their larger foundational project is to underpin all that thermodynamics tells us about the world, then the answer, at least initially, seems to be both laws. Um, that is, foundational, these foundational programs should aim at accounting for accounting, well, should aim at accounting for both the minus first law and the second law of thermodynamics. And the rationale for this is as follows, right? I mean, since the minus first law is um, distinct from, um, and lo well, more importantly, logically independent of the second law, right? Um, with the caveat that um, you know, the second law only makes sense given some notion of equilibrium and to a certain extent the minus first law makes that notion coherent, right? Um, it cannot be the case that a derivation of one of these laws is ipso facto a derivation of the other, right? So um, even if foundational projects succeed in providing a derivation of one of these laws, um, they're still going to be left with the task of accounting for the other. Now, um, how large or how difficult a project the remaining one would be would obviously depend upon which um, law is accounted for first, because it could be that some result used in the derivation of one of them perhaps contributes maybe significantly to, um, to the justification of the other. Um, but now, despite the fact that most of what I've said up until this point um, suggests that contributors to the foundational project aim at accounting for both the minus first law and the second law of thermodynamics, um, I actually sh think that they shouldn't directly aim at either of them. 
Well, why do I think this? Well, because, well, you're not going to get them. I don't think you're going to get them. At least not the strict interpretations of them anyway. <laughs> right? Take, for instance, the minus um, first law, right? A problem with deriving this law will be familiar to um, those of you who are familiar to the objections um, to Ludwig Boltzmann's H theorem. Right. Um, Wayne covered some of what I'm about to say, but it bears repeating. Um, I'll say it in a similar but different way. Maybe you'll get something different or something else out of it, or if not, hopefully you'll at least feel like you've got something um, new out of it. So Ludwig Boltzmann famously attempted to count for irreversible macroscopic processes in a classical um, framework, or at least one instance of it. Right? In 1872, he considered how the distribution of velocities of the molecules of a dilute gas could be expected to change under collisions, and argued that there was this unique distribution, which we now call the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, that was stable under collisions. Boltzmann further argued that, um, that a gas that initially began with a dis different distribution would um, move towards the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Right? And to argue for this, he first defined a quantity which, as Wayne pointed out, we now call H, um, showed that it reached a minimum value for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and um, argued that it would monotonically decrease to its minimum. This result is now known as Boltzmann's H theorem. It's a straightforward consequence of what's known as Boltzmann's transport equation. And importantly, the result is um, asymmetric under time reversal. Now, in the wake of this, many began to wonder how Boltzmann arrived at this result, having only assumed a dynamics that's symmetric under time reversal. Right? It was later discovered that he did it, and two famous objections have shown that he couldn't. Right? These are known as the reversibility and recurrence objections. The reversibility objection um, is usually credited to Josef Loschmidt, and it notes that for any set of trajectories of the molecules of Boltzmann's gas, the time reverse trajectories are also compatible with the dynamics. So not all microstates at any time lead to a monotonic decrease of this quantity H. Right. This is a straightforward consequence of assuming that the microdynamics are symmetric under time reversal. And then there's um, the recurrence objection. This one's usually credited to Ernest Zermelo, often thought to be Boltzmann's nemesis. Um, it applies to classical systems with bounded phase space energy hypersurfaces. Um, that is to systems with total fixed energy, um, such as Boltzmann's gas. And it, and it works like this. So, um, consider some small neighborhood around the system's initial state and ask, will the system, after it leaves that neighborhood, ever return to it? And the answer, which makes use of Henry Poincaré's recurrence theorem, is yes, it will, for almost all initial phase space points. Right. That is all except the set of LeBay measure zero. More plainly, but less precisely, the objection notes that no microstate yields a monotonic decrease of this quantity H. OK, returning now to the minus first law, um, the problem is that if equilibrium states uh, characterize as ones that once they're reached, they thereafter remain constant in time, right, then at least in a Boltzmannian framework, they will typically um, not be reached, given the dynamics recurrence property. If you wait long enough, all sorts of pressure fluctuations, for example, will occur. Um, and notice that it doesn't really matter how generous we are with the bounds of the values of the parameters that coincide with the candidate equilibrium state. Right? Wait long enough, and the system will fluctuate outside of those bounds. Now, as for the second law, the recurrence and reversibility objections um, to Boltzmann's H theorem, ensure that it's not possible to derive a strict um, interpretation of the laws from the underlying dynamics alone. Okay, so maybe it's not a good idea to directly aim at um, underpinning these laws. Perhaps the thing to do, taking into account the lessons of um, the objections, is to 
um, not take thermodynamics too seriously, um, and to look at constructing suitable analogues of these laws. Right? In effect, then, we'd be aiming at, um, say, underpinning probabilistic versions of the minus first law and second laws of thermodynamics that incorporate some more generous and flexible notion of equilibrium, for example. OK, so should this be the aim of the foundational project? Right? Namely, underpinning suitably revised approximate versions of the minus first law and second law of thermodynamics. Um, perhaps surprisingly, I again think the answer is no. Why shouldn't this be the aim of the foundational project? Well, because even if it is successful, it wouldn't do very much to account for the irreversible processes that are supposed to be at the very core of this project. Why is that, you ask? Well, um, I'll speak on behalf of, maybe speak on behalf of David. So if David was here, um, he might say what appears in this paper that he's written, the quantitative content of statistical mechanics. Um, as David points out in this paper, the laws and primitive concepts of thermodynamics are individually and collectively, effectively, predictively useless. What do I mean? Well, all right. Suppose that you grant all of the primitive concepts, all the primitive laws of thermodynamics. Help yourself to the minus first law, um, the zeroth law, the, the first law, the second, the third. Help yourself. Suppose um, you've got concepts like quasi-static processes, thermal contact, and so on. Right? Now, further suppose that you accept all of these, um, that all of these things are known to hold of, say, um, a box of gas of total volume and external energy. And now ask, what can be deduced about the behavior of the box? And as David, as rightly notes, basically nothing. Um, as he writes, yes, the box will have some equilibrium state to which it will relax on some unspecified time scale. Increasing or decreasing its volume may or may not lead to changes in its internal energy. It will not be possible to use the box to play certain roles in various heat engines. It will not, for instance, be possible to operate it in a cycle to turn heat into work. Yes, it will have some thermodynamic temperature and if placed in thermal contact with a lower temperature system, it will transfer heat to that system. Yes, it will have some entropy which cannot be induced to decrease in an adiabatic process. But on what the temperature is or the entropy for a given volume, on how much work must be done or will be generated in contracting the box, on even whether the box is of uniform density, on all of these questions, thermodynamics in the abstract is silent. The second law, or the first, or the zeroth, or the minus first, or all of them together, do not so much as predict that a box of gas initially confined to one half of a box will expand to occupy the whole box. Okay. But then, if our aim... Just let it so, uh, go on, but you're on your... You okay, I've only got about maybe two minutes left anyway. Cool. Um, okay. But now, remember that if our aim is to, un, uh, is to underpin irreversible processes, right, then why should the focus be on underpinning laws and concepts that say so little about them? Right? Why not rather attempt to account for um, the particulars of the very phenomena that are the extensions of the concepts of irreversible processes, right? The phenomena that motivated the laws in the first place, right? So if we can account for why gases, for example, um, exhibit the particular irreversible behaviour that they do, along with why it's not, um, why we cannot recover their initial state without doing work, right? then we'll be in possession of a more complete um, and solid foundation of irreversible processes, and at the same time have accounted for why the thermodynamic um, laws and concepts that apply to these systems hold. Now, of course, 
Um, if the aim is to account for the phenomena that the support the laws and concepts of thermodynamics, then yes, the project is now, um, the foundational project becomes more piecemeal. But at least it'll do justice to um, the concepts that contributors to foundational discussions were after in the first place. Right? That they were really attempting to underpin. Okay, I'll end now by just reminding you of hopefully what I've achieved here today. So first I highlighted that um, the aim of underpinning irreversible processes is, strictly speaking, ambiguous. And second, I highlighted that despite this ambiguity, those people contributing, um, or at least have been contributing to this discussion, are best interpreted as aiming to account for the minus first law, despite the ways in which they often state their aims. Um, and third, I've suggested that contributors to this foundational project neither aim directly at accounting for the minus first law or the second law of thermodynamics, but rather that they aim at accounting for the phenomena that support these laws. Okay, thank you all very much. Okay, so I suppose what I had in mind is, look, um, if, you're, if you're going to, um, if you're attempting to account for irreversible processes, the kinds of irreversible processes that kind of motivated this whole investigation, right? Like why, why a box of gas, once you remove a partition, happens to um, move towards a state that we would likely call equilibrium. Then what I think, um, what you want to do is to account for um, so much of the particulars that we can get out of that process, right? That, um, that the system is going to move from um, its initial state to its final state kind of smoothly, that its temperature is going to um, either increase or well, decrease, um, and that it's going to do so smoothly, that it's going to transition at roughly the rates that it does. Um, you know, that you're going to be able to track its other things, like its um, changes in pressure, its, its changes in entropy. Um, and so I think that if you're going to account for irreversible processes, then you need to account for the very irreversible processes that, um, that inspired the generation of the laws um, in the first place. So um, when I mean, when I say a complete, I mean recover all of these particular details of um, the irreversible process. <coughs> and so this is why you can see why I say that it's kind of piecemeal, because look, um, look, gases, you know, when they evolve to a state of equilibrium, do something very different from what a brick does. Um, and so um, I tell you, you're not really going to be after um, some kind of very general um, account of why systems approach a state of equilibrium. Rather, you're going to need to kind of tell different stories for different systems. Um, yeah. So um, I just wonder, isn't being specific also does it mean that you know, that we cannot be very general in some sense? If you say, suppose we understand in more detail how the gas expands and fills up the box, and then through the earth for the possibility yeah. We could encounter tomorrow some bricks of material that we would want to apply as a thermodynamics, but then we're not sure if our thermodynamics still works for that system. So why should we not? So I guess I try to understand a bit more why you think it, we should not try to find, say, some general principles or some simple assumptions that apply broadly to lots of systems and always will be 
Right. So I mean, maybe there's a happy maybe there's a happy balance to be made. I mean, I think part of the problem is just, I mean, the the laws of thermodynamics are just so broad um, that that's what renders them effectively, predictively, individually and collectively useless. Um, I mean, on the on the other hand, I mean, if um, you know. I don't know, look, if you've got reason to think that this, say, new material is um, similar in certain respects to other materials for which you've got some kind of detailed story of um, um, why it is you would account for the area reversible processes, then I take it then, I mean, maybe you can scoop this new thing up under, um, under that. But, um, uh, you know, hopefully then you've struck this, I think, hopefully then you've struck this kind of happy ground between um, having enough having enough details in there such that you're going to account for the particulars, you know, the particular measurable quantities that you happen to um, observe without running into the problem of having said something so general that um, basically you've said nothing at all about, um, you know, the, the system that was similar or this new one that... Um, you happen to come across. When I think I'm kind of pushing in a similar vein. So the way you put it makes it sound like the laws of um, thermodynamics are completely useless and completely empty. Well, why did anyone care about them in the first place? Right. So when um, Kelvin, who's the one who, who first spoke of first and second law of thermodynamics, he writes these you know, proposition first law, second law, yeah. he thought he was saying something important. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, so... I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to say. I mean, yes, he was saying something important. Uh, but look, uh, I think we can now say much better things. Um, and, um, you know, much better in the sense that we can say much more detailed things that, um, uh, that concern the, I mean, concern the same kinds of phenomena in, in both cases. Um, and so, I don't know, I'd be inclined to say, um, why not say more, given that we now have the ability to say more than to say less, um, you know, even if we still recognise some interesting consequences and um, regularities that can occur given um, things formulated in this more kind of general abstract kind of way. Uh, I mean, I'm not... Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, maybe, I, maybe I want to say in response to that, um, yes, what he said was important, and now I'm inclined to say, now, not so much. Uh, but um, well, I, don't know. I don't know whether that's being uncharitable. Uh, perhaps, perhaps it is, yeah. Well, I mean, the only thing, let's think of a, a, a similar project. For, uh, uh, is, so take, for example, conservation costs. So, uh, things like, the things where we originally say empirically um, um, derived, and then, so it comes along and says, well, within the framework of Hamiltonian mechanics, we can show that uh, there's this relation between conservation laws and, and, and symmetries of the Hamiltonian. Now, it's true that if I tell you a system that a system is falls within that framework, that tells you nothing at all about the system until, you, uh, it, it, uh, until I tell you what the Hamiltonian for the system is. Yeah. But it still seems like there's a role for elucidating a general framework of which and showing consequences of some very general um, uh, things that were hold for a wide variety of systems. Because then, if you do have that, then you get each particular instantiation of it for free. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that, 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 that was very important. When I think about what Carnot was doing, 
question that Carmel was um, raising was an actually act, uh, um, active question at the time is, can I make a statement, and, and, and th th does the medium you're using in, in, in a heat engine um, affect its efficiency? Right. Can you get more efficiency if you're using, you know, if people were using um, ether, of all things, mm -hmm. as, as, as the um, expanding medium instead of ordinary air because they thought they could get more efficiency, of course, those would blow up every once in a while. Yeah. Right? It seems to be very important to, to know that, okay, no, second law of thermodynamics says that the, the maximum achievable efficiency between two reservoirs depends only on the temperatures of the reservoirs and nothing at all, not at all on the properties of, of, um, of the, of the medium, working medium. So you know, knowing that saved, has saved luck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, okay. So maybe, maybe, there, maybe there is value in both, maybe there's value in both projects. Uh, I suppose then maybe the, maybe the appropriate thing that I'd want to say is, um, look, there's value in that, but that's not, that's not everything. Um, and um, in particular, um, you know, look look at here all look at here all the other things that kind of go unaccounted for, even if you um, provide an underpinning for, for those things. Um, and in particular, I think I mean I'm pushed in this direction because I I feel this I feel this awkward, uncomfortable um, sensation when there just seems to be such a large disconnect between, um, I think, what statistical mechanics actually gets used for and what, um, you know, foundational discussions of um, it and thermodynamics um, involve in philosophical literature. And I suppose part of this is, um, I mean, I want to, I want to, you know, rip things um, Further into the direction of actual scientific, um, actual scientific use, but I, I take the point. Maybe maybe I shouldn't pull so hard on it so as to exclude the um, uh, the importance of underpinning these very general things at the same time. I think you rightly pointed out that in the literature, 
they're often seem to be a conflation of the second law and the Bible's first law. Like yep. if people are talking about the second law, what they're really are talking about this tendency towards the world. Interestingly enough, that has a long history. And Clausius himself, who um, gave us one of the earliest form formulations of what we call the second law, um, which he quoted, then gives a form formal, informal gloss on it as the entropy of the universe strives towards it, tends towards an excellence. And Boltzmann himself would often, when he's doing his work on equilibration, would say, I've tried to derive the second law of aerodynamics. And, well, here's, here, here's, here's a question. Well, what is the difference? So if I say that as a consequence of the second law of aerodynamics, that an isolated system, entropy cannot um, decrease, how does, tell me, how does that differ from saying it's going, it, 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 it's, it's going to equilibrate? This, the, this isolated system, what, I, I know the, 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 whatever happens to it is not going to be a, a um, decrease in entropy. Yeah. You know, you imagine someone like Clausius you know, saying, well, oh, how's that different than that saying it reacts to its equilibrium with its entropy maximum? Yeah, uh, so I don't have anything good to say about this. Like I'm worried about this myself, in part, uh, out of concern that someone in an audience would ask me this very question. And, <laughs> and in part, I've hoped that Yost would be in the audience uh, when this would happen, because I feel like uh, I've, heard, I've heard him explain. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, <laughs> you know, Yost got caught up in the Canadian government's oppressive policies that require a visa from people with a new passport didn't know it, he didn't know it until he got to the airport. Right, um, that's rough. So, um, he's going to, Yosef's going to be Skyping in tomorrow. Unfortunately, he won't be actually physically present. Okay. Um, so, I, do, I don't have a good answer to that, but I, I should say, um, I, am, I am thinking about it. Uh, and, um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that rather than attempt to say something that um, is muddled. So, yeah. Uh, but I'm interested in hearing thought. I, I'm he interested in hearing answers to that question. Um, if other people have uh, suggestions. Well, how, how, how does the second law differ? Why does the second law entail the minus first law? Sorry, why does it not entail the minus first law? So it's an so isolated system entropy can't de decrease. And the minus work first law says for an isolated system, it's going to um, uh, um, spontaneously go to a equilibrium state, which is its maximum entropy state. So the cows, cows, cows are different. They're closely. Oh, yeah, they're obviously very closely related to one another. Well, I, mean, I mean, I think, okay, I actually think I can answer the part of my question. Well, um, the second law, so suppose something's not in its maximum entropy state. The second law doesn't say anything's going to happen. It could just stay in a, in a, in a state of, as far as the second law is concerned, it could just remain in a state of non-maximal entropy. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so um, you know, pull the partition out, the second law doesn't say it's not going to just get the gap and it's just going to stay in one side. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. And then um, also in another part of minus first law. So so the second law says if anything's going to happen to that isolated system, it's not going to be entropy decreasing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It doesn't say anything's going to happen. Right. Yes. And another it is um, the minus first law says that um, there's a unique state of equilibrium. Yeah. And the second law by itself doesn't say there's going to be a unique maximum entropy state. Yes. Yeah. It could go the other way. Yeah. 
push the bit, you can go and have a workout. And yeah. You let it recover back to its equilibrium state, and you've got special motion in it. So minus plus the true. Yeah. Printing is approached a spontaneous equilibrium state. Yeah. yeah. So that's not the natural entropy system. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Said that the aims. So this one. Aim at accounting for the phenomena that support the laws of thermodynamics. So just. So is if, if if I were to rephrase what you're saying, would would it would something like this be right? So the aim is not to capture facts about the state and space of thermodynamic systems. That thermodynamics tells you things like you know like there there is a unique and so on. So the aim is to capture the phenomenological features of the dynamics. Is that, is that another way of saying? Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the kinds of, I mean, the kinds of systems that support um, the laws of thermodynamics, like, in, say, the minus first law, I mean, they come, they come with so much more detail than simply there's a unique equilibrium state that the system reaches, right? And um, you know that that state has got some particular pressure, temperature, um, and volume, and and moreover, it's got values of those things along the way. Um, and um, you're not going to get. Um, I mean, simply counting, simply simply aiming and accounting. Um, for the laws themselves does not guarantee that you're going to get that extra information, despite the fact that this was exactly the kind of process that led you to write the very general um, law in the first place. So, um, so my suggestion is um, aim at accounting for, I mean, aim at accounting for the, these particulars. And look, yes, you'll also have accounted for the laws in the process, um, at least as they apply to um, certain collections of systems, right? Because obviously gases and bricks are um, very different things. But um, yeah, you will have done you will have done more. I can just come back. So so then uh, I just so what I'm, what I'm just wondering maybe you could say a little bit more about. So what work is phenomena doing in that story as opposed to uh, behavior of classical mechanical systems or other or is, or is or, 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 or what, what, what work is the word phenomena doing as opposed to the dynamics of classical mechanical systems? Um, uh, is there a distinction so. that you're making? Or? I, if, if there is, I'm not sure that I intended one. Um, I mean, yeah. The best I could say is it's a shorter way of saying the same thing, but I'll put it on a slide to, um, so I can have a large font. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just there in a thermodynamic philosophy. 
themselves. Yeah. And I was thinking maybe you were going to say uh, more about anyway. That was sort of the well, Okay. So. I mean, I suppose maybe it's worth saying this. So, I mean, what's kind of going on in the background is, you know, look, I've got, I've got other projects um, in these areas that I'm interested in. And, I mean, one of them is accounting for why um, a collection of, you know, very successful transport equations within statistical mechanics are predictively, um, quantitatively effective. Things like, I mean, say what you will about, um, the Boltzmann equation, but nonetheless, the Boltzmann equation, for example, kind of can make very accurate predictions about the behaviours of um, the systems to which it applies. And there's a question about why why are equations like that so successful? Equations like that um, predict irreversible behaviour, right? So they, um, if you can account for say why the Boltzmann equation, for example, is um, successful, then you will have accounted for a spontaneous approach to equilibrium, but um, at the same time, you have also accounted for why the systems to which it apply to, um, why you can say all of these other things about um, um, those systems. So um, by kind of, I think, if you focus your energy on accounting for, say, the success of something like that, then you'll get you get what contributors to this discussion want out for free, but at the same time, you will have also um, accounted for the other aspects of the irreversible, the particulars of the irreversible phenomena that um, you know went into um, motivating these laws in the in the first place. Um, so yeah, so that, that's what I, that's where I think things should be better directed at. Um, rather than, I mean, because I think there are ways of, um, look, there are ways that are attempting to account for these particular laws that are going to sidestep. Um, I don't know, I mean, whether or not you regard them as successful or not, but they, at least they're going to sidestep um, questions about particulars. Okay, really short, but we're all set. Okay, so I, I have a question about this two notion of irreversibility. Sure. Yeah. So I can see clearly how these are different if you take a particular instantiation of, of two states and some evolution in between them. Mm -hmm. But what's not so clear to me is how exactly they differ if you take them to uh, apply to any any pair of states, for example. For example, all, all pairs of states throughout the, the evolution. Oh. Uh. Do you have an idea of what would be like the main difference between it or if at all? So um, well, I mean, so, um, I'm not sure that I've got anything particularly helpful on here that would speak to this question. I mean, so. Um, yeah, I mean, it was. Right, so there's this time reversal, invariance, and the recoverability. I mean, the, the three ways in which I distinguish them following Yost was, um, look, um, in terms of recoverability, there's a focus on the environment, not just simply um, a return of the system to its initial state. Um, so I take it um, that's still a difference um, according to this. Um, there's also talk, um, I mean, what's not, Perhaps what's not covered is, um, look, if we're, if we're just talking about, um, um, you know, if you don't have, if you're not talking about an initial and final state without there being something in between, then I take it in that sense, um, you know, the history reversal operation and a kind of a recoverability of the initial state, that kind of vanishes because there just is no, there just is no other, um, intermediate state to which um, you know the system could go backwards via um, without going through the reverse sequence um, and then there's this talk of um, the difference being the you know um, 
the notion of possibility implicitly invoked. Um, so there again, so there it may be the case that um, uh, yeah, I mean, I take it that it might be that um, since for recoverability it needs to be possible for beings like us with our epistemic and physical limitations to recover the initial state that, um, look, if we're just collapsing this down, um, then, look, it may be the case that it's compatible with the laws and yet not the case that it's possible for us to do it. Um, and so I take it that could still be, um, that could still provide a difference between these two notions. So I take it it's maybe only one of these three differences that would collapse under um, this suggestion. At least that's my initial thought to it. Yeah, there are further questions or this question, we can take them. Coffee break. Let's thank Josh once again.